Kentucky in the new nation, 1792 through 1815, and Kentucky after 50 years of statehood. The French Revolution started in the 1780s for liberty and death, or death, and then of course it ended with death for many thousands of its French citizens, which included the royal family. The French Revolution lasted between 1789 and 1799. As you can see, the ones who lost their head, lost their head through Madame Guillotine. Now, I know you think it's silly to open up a presentation of Kentucky history with something about European history. But you can't understand and realize the importance of Kentucky in our nation's development unless you understand what's going on in the world and the rest of the United States. So we know now that the French Revolution is going on in Europe. But just do just a little bit of background on the U.S. history so you'll know a little bit more. President Washington served two terms and left. John Adams, who had been his vice president, was elected president in 1896. Now, he was a Federalist. He and Washington were the leaders of the Federalist Party, which wasn't a party so much as an opinion. But the Federalists that we're going to call them such uh, were for strong federal government. The Anti-Federalists, which is as it indicates were those who were against it, they were for a strong states government. They were led by Thomas Jefferson and were known as either Jeffersonian Republicans or Democratic Republicans. Now John Adams and the Federalist Party believed that the French Revolution had spiraled out of control, which it had really had. It had gone from being a fight or revolution to overthrow a monarchy to, if you disagreed with anything the leaders of the country were saying, you were sent to Madame Guillotine. The Anti-Federalists, led by Jefferson, said it's just bad propaganda that the French people were merely fighting for their freedom much as we had. Meanwhile, one of the unique things about the revolution it had begun because the poor people were so poor they couldn't even afford to buy bread. Now when you overthrow a government and you try to set up a new government and you've got millions of unemployed people, one of the first things you've got to do is get them work so they can work and buy their bread. But well, the French came up with a rather unique way to employ their unemployed. They put them in the military. And they sent them out to do war against their neighboring countries. Well, in wartime, you live off the land, so to speak. Now, if you were unsuccessful, of course, you die, which takes care of the population problem. If you are successful, you get booty or bounty. And you live off the land and take from those that you have defeated. So there again, you've taken care of it. You've taken care of the people who were unemployed. So what had started out basically as a way to end the unemployment problem wound up with France being against war against all the countries around her. And the strange thing was, is they started winning. Well, of course, this brings her into conflict with England again. As I said, how many times have you counted in just this short few lessons that we've had that I've said that England and France were at war again? Well, they're at it again. And they're stopping the shipping. They're trying to block each other's trade, and they set up treaties and stop people. And they don't want us to. Tra England doesn't want us to trade with France, and France doesn't want us to trade with England. And meanwhile, we're kind of caught in the middle. Although President Washington and both Adams have declared our neutrality, so we are not getting into this at all, any one way or the other. So President Adams sends an envoy to France to see if we can't work out some kind of trade and have the French let us trade at least non-military goods. And the gentleman that they were to talk to demanded large loans from the government. They demanded an outrageous bribe as well as an apology for President Adams condemning the revolution. Now these men that they met were called X, Y, and Z because we never did learn their real names. Well when word was discovered here in this world, in this country, that uh, President Adams released the contents of some letters he'd gotten back explaining what was going on with this XYZ stuff. It became known as the XYZ Affair. And there was a wave of anti-British sentiment that seemed to sweep the nation. Well, this gave Adams and his Congress a little spurt because the Federalist Party was losing a lot of popularity. And they decided that the best thing they could do was to protect the American citizens. And this happens in any war that we have. It, it happens right now with what's going on in overseas. Um, the government wants to protect our citizens and they do this by well censoring information, keeping us from knowing the bad things that are going on and in this case 
Adams and the Congress passed something they called a series of alien and sedition acts. And in some ways, they're going to remind you of the Patriot Act that's going on today. Number one, they increased naturalization from five to 14 years for citizenship. And then the Alien Friends Act, of course, gave the president power to imprison or deport anyone he considered dangerous aliens. The Sedition Act, that was the one that caused the most problems. It made it a high misdemeanor to assemble with intent to oppose the government or publish malicious writing about the president. So in other words, if you weren't careful and you were a newspaper editor and you said something about you didn't like the way President Adams was conducting the war or conducting his uh, negotiations, you could actually be arrested. Adams is genuinely trying to protect the American people. But there is a lot of protest, and one of the biggest ones was it was very ill-advised legislation because you're punishing people who were innocent. There's a stream of violation of American civil liberties. Yes, we heard that even back in the 1700s. The claim that the acts were unconstitutional, and of course Thomas Jefferson is leading all these protests. He stated that if the American public accepted these alien and sedition acts with no protest, that very certainly we would lose all of our liberties. Enter a young man, a redhead from Kentucky, called John Breckinridge. He and President Jefferson have become close personal friends, and Breckinridge is now a United States Senator from Kentucky to the uh, Federal Congress. They both agreed that the acts were unconstitutional, so they decided to compose a document. And historians have long debated who actually wrote it. Was it Jefferson, was it Breckinridge, or was Madison or Monroe even involved in this? But whatever it was, uh, we're going to give credit to Breckinridge and to Jefferson. These acts are called Kentucky Resolutions, and it stated that a state has the right to override a federal law. It's called nullification or repeal. Now, this word nullification, this is the first time we're hearing it, but it's not going to be the last. It's going to be used time and time again over the next 60 years. Well, the state of Vermont had a response to this. that the people formed the government, and no state had the right to judge the actions of the national government. In other words, get over is what they're saying. But Kentucky does adopt these resolutions. And per your text, quote, if you use these adoptions, I mean, you adopt these resolutions, if it's carried to an extreme, the doctrine could be used or would be used later to justify secession of a state. That's exactly what's going to happen in 1860. But the combination of the Alien Sedition Acts and this Kentucky Resolution and the Federalist losing popularity, it cost Adams a second term. Of course, he had also put up some barriers for trading. Meanwhile, let's talk about John Breckinridge just a minute. As I said, he's fairly new to Kentucky. He came in uh, 1792 and became involved in the political process immediately. And every time you turn around, he's leading some kind of protest against the federal government, which is irony because he is a U.S. Senator now and close personal friends with the president. But the Virginia laws we brought over when we became a state, uh, it was part of the deal with separating from Virginia. And I have some funny laws here. For instance, um, it's against the law in Kentucky to kiss anyone on the steps of the state house. It's also against the law to marry your own grandmother. It's also against the law to take a bath without permission. Now, these are some silly old laws that have been on the books for hundreds of years and have never really taken off. But Mr. John Breckinridge, or Senator, rather, John Breckinridge, wasn't looking at the funny laws. He was looking at the penal laws. And he decided we needed a new code because we had brought over like something like 75 different laws that you could be executed for. They were on the books from when the Virginia colony was first started and you had Jamestown. Like if you were killed a chicken, you could be executed because you're taking food and taking the future production of eggs away from us. If you pulled a plant out there that was a real plant and not a weed, you could be executed. I mean, they were trying to protect the food supply at the time, but these laws were still there and we brought them over. So we needed to have some kind of change. And one of the first things he wanted to change is when a person is sent to prison, he needs to be reformed. He needs to pay back monies that were used for his trial. And, and if he sold money from someone, it needs to be repaid. And you also need the training so when he gets out of prison, he can do an honest day's work. Now, the way to do this is to hard labor, hard physical labor, cracking rocks with a big old hammer. And you're going to force repentance this way. And like I said, part of the training would be to teach an honest trade. 
and eliminate this death penalty for anything except first degree murder. And also they would build a new penitentiary. And this was, it seems harsh to us now, because I mean, like they had cornmeal and maybe meat twice a week, but for the time, it was very cutting edge. We were really out there. So all this is going on in the late 1890s. Like I said, the Alien and Sedition Acts and this problem with the Kentucky Resolutions cost Mr. Adams his second term. It was a close election. But Thomas Jefferson won the presidency. And of course, we in Kentucky were very, very happy because he was from Virginia. And after all, Virginia was our mother state. But Thomas Jefferson faces some problems. In 1802, Spain closes the port of New Orleans again. Every time we turn around, it's something. So Jefferson says, you know, <sighs> Kentuckians wanted to go down there and kick Spanish butt. But Jefferson said, no, we're going to talk to France to see if maybe we can buy a support ourselves down there. And this would eliminate this problem. Meanwhile, Napoleon, who had uh, been asked to put down some riots in France, he brings the French army in and he overturns the government and makes himself the Emperor of France. And he wasn't all that. He did some mighty good things for France while we were if we were in European history, we'd go into them, but we won't. But he decides he wants to take back the land that the French had lost during the French and Indian War back in 1863. Or 1763, rather. So he sends an army over into the islands, and there is a rebellion because the, uh, the blacks outnumbered the whites on the islands about 500 to 1. And they had heard about this French Revolution and all the rights and privileges that the Frenchman was getting, and they decided that they wanted them too. So they're doing a rebellion in the islands. And Napoleon, it was his first battle he ever lost. He was a great statistician and a military leader. But if he can't subdue a little island rebellion, and part of it's because of your distance of supply. I mean, France is a long way from those Caribbean islands. And by the time you get supplies over there, or you get word back to France of what's going on, you know, it's, it's already too late. So between the heat and the rebellion and everything else, he was losing. So he decided that there was no way he was going to take back the Louisiana Purchase. So when Jefferson's envoy got there to buy a port, Napoleon offered to sell us the entire problem, the entire thing for $15 million, just a few cents an acre. Well, this was great. I mean, totally, absolutely wonderful. The, the problem of moving west beyond the Mississippi River was now going to be solved. But there was a problem. Because the United States Constitution did not give the United States Senate the authority to purchase land. We could have someone give it to us. We could uh, get it to join us, but we couldn't buy it. And Jefferson is a strict constitutionalist. Enter our beloved John Breckinridge of Kentucky again. As I repeat, he's become a very close personal friend of the president. So President Jefferson is asking Senator Breckinridge uh, to propose an amendment to the Constitution so that we can buy. And I, I can just visualize them sitting there talking and Senator Breckinridge saying, Now, Mr. President, do you have any idea how long that would take? Well, it would take absolutely years and years and years because it takes at least 10 years to get an amendment to the Constitution approved by the rest of the states. We can get it past Congress, but getting the states to ratify is what's going to take so long. And I can just see him patting the president on the hand and saying, don't worry about it, Mr. President, I'll take care of it. So he takes it upon himself to push a bill through Congress to the purchase, and it was approved, although it was unconstitutional totally. So we've got the purchase, we've got the land, we no longer have to worry about Napoleon here. But we still have problems, and I've got six listed there. Number one, as I said, the purchase was totally unconstitutional. Two, we had no clue what was out there. We knew there was a bunch of land, and we knew there was an ocean out there somewhere, but we had no idea who was out there or what was out there. Uh, we didn't know who. We didn't know what. Therefore, the reason for the Lewis and Clark expedition, he was hoping that they would find an all-waterway from the Atlantic to the Pacific. If not, he was to find out who exactly is out there, what kind of Indians are out there. Are they friendly? What kind of flora? Do we have gold, silver? What do we got out there? Like I said, the exact boundaries of the area were never settled for several years. And what's going to be the future of all this area once it satisfies all the requirements that the United States has for a territory to become a state? Is it going to be one big state? Is it going to be a hundred little states? 
And when they ask to join the union, are they going to come in as a free state or a slave state? All these questions should have been considered more carefully than they were. Meanwhile, the Spanish in New Orleans, they didn't want to become American. They weren't even too thrilled about being French again. Because one of the first things Napoleon had done was see he had persuaded, and I say persuaded is too mild a word, the king of Spain to give New Orleans back to France. Because, see, you know, New Orleans had been taken from France and given to Spain during the uh, French and Indian War. Spain doesn't want to become French and she doesn't want to become American. And for a while, the Kentucky fighters thought they were going to get to go down the Mississippi and kick some Spanish behind and get repaid with land because that's one of the first things we always did in Kentucky. We paid our fighters with land. But the governor put a cayuse to that. Enter Aaron Burr, one of my most favorite people in history. Uh, Aaron Burr was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was of the upper class. From a very prestigious family, he had education, he had uh, bearing, he had social status. He was a colonel in the Revolutionary War, but because of, uh, shall we say, disagreements, he couldn't get along with President Washington very well. He was too outspoken. And then he got sick, and he had to resign his commission. But he was a very successful New York lawyer. I've listed some of the things he's known for. He became Vice President of the United States under Jefferson in 1800, which was a riot. Uh, as a historian, I never could figure out why Burr, a New York politician, and kind of an on-the-fence Federalist, would he have any desire to be the Vice President of a man who was an anti-Federalist? Until I did a lot more research on him, and I realized that Aaron Burr was a very ambitious man, and his greatest desire in life was to become the governor of the state of New York. He was wealthy. He was married to a widow who had children. They had children themselves. He had social position. Uh, he was well respected as a lawyer and also respected in the political party of New York, which has one of the largest delegations of her uh, electorals around. And I guess he got to thinking it would look good on his resume, if you would, to have been vice president. Then he could run for governor. Well, the problem was in the 1800 election, uh, there was a tie vote between Burr and Jefferson. And so it was 36 some odd votes taken in Congress before it was finally decided who was going to be president and who was going to be vice president. And Jefferson won by one vote. Otherwise, we would have had President Burr instead of President Jefferson. But the way the Constitution was written, if there was a tie, it would be thrown into a special committee in Congress and they would decide. Now, enter Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton, of course, had been Washington's first Secretary of, of Treasury. He had done a remarkable job making our country sound physically. But he was everything he wanted to be was what Burr had been. Uh, now, Burr, as I said, was successful, born with a spoon in his mouth. Alexander Hamilton, and he's one of the few people in history I can actually say this about, he was a bastard. His father never married his mother, and when his mother died, he took the child from the islands and took the child back to France and had his wife raise his illegitimate child. Now, we don't have this problem today, but back in the 1700s, as they say, the sins of the father falls upon the child. And so he was always condemned and blamed for being a bastard, or as they say, born on the wrong side of the blanket. He tried so hard to overcome his beginnings, and he was a smart man, a brilliant man. But he was jealous of Aaron Burr, because Aaron Burr had what he wanted. He had the social position. He had the prestige. But when the Revolutionary War broke out and he managed to, uh, well, I like it. I know it sounds too terrible to say he wormed his way into Washington's confidence, but he wound up being the son to Washington that he never had. And as long as George Washington was around, of course, he was accepted in polite society, because who's going to say anything to General Washington or then later President Washington? But Washington's out of the scene. As a matter of fact, Washington died in 1799. Uh, Alexander Hamilton has lost the confidence of his party. His protector and father figure, if you would, and mentor, is gone. Uh, he's having an open affair with a married woman in Philadelphia. He's being looked down upon. And he decides that all of his problems are Aaron Burr's fault. Now... So Alexander Hamilton started writing a series of articles in the newspaper 
about Aaron Burr. And Aaron Burr took them like a gentleman as long as he attacked his political position, as long as he attacked him personally. But before you know it, Alexander Hamilton started attacking him personally as well as his family. And that was just more than Aaron Burr could handle. So he challenged Alexander Hamilton to a duel. Hamilton also blamed Burr for the death of his son because his son had been killed in a duel and uh, the man who had won the duel with Alexander Hamilton's son knew Burr. So in, in Alexander Hamilton's twisted mind, Burr had put his friend up to killing his son. Uh, my own personal opinion is that Hamilton had lost it. So anyway, there's Burr challenges Hamilton to the duel. Now, back in those days, there were laws. It was it was legal to have a duel. Of course, you and I wouldn't have a duel. We're not of that right social setting. We would go out behind the barn and duke it out. But if you were wealthy and respected like, you know, these people were, then uh, you have a duel. And the person who is challenged, according to the rules of duello, he has the right to choose what we're going to use. He could choose to go out behind a barn if he wanted to, but they would usually choose swords or sabers or dueling pistols. And in this instance, Alexander Hamilton chose dueling pistols and used his very own set of dueling pistols. Now, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Bow had both been in duels before. And there are certain rules. And it wasn't a public affair. There would be you uh, and your opponent. There would be a second. There would be a judge and a doctor. So you're looking at less than six people. And they met on a foggy June morning on the banks of a river in New Jersey. And Hamilton and Burr put their backs together. And the judge counts off ten paces. And they turn and all of a sudden you hear this go whack. And a shot whizzes over Aaron Burr's head. Hamilton, who was a great shot, who had been in duels before and always wounded his opponent, had missed Burr. The shot went way over Burr's head and hit a tree. Well, you say, why didn't that end it right then and there? Because of the rules of duello. Burr has to take a shot. If Burr doesn't take a shot, Alexander Hamilton is entitled to a second shot with him with his gun beside his side. So, Burr, being the gentleman he was, shoots at Alexander Hamilton. And no, he did not shoot to kill. He shot to wound. He shot him in the leg. Well, how did Hamilton die? Because of a freak accident, the bullet hit a bone in Alexander Hamilton's leg and traveled up his leg to his stomach. And a shot in the stomach is pretty much always fatal. So Alexander Hamilton died. And immediately, this man who had been, you know, down in the dumps, down at the very bottom of popularity, New Jersey and New York both issued warrants of arrest to Aaron Burr, who was still the sitting vice president of the United States. And he'd done nothing wrong. Dueling was legal in both those states, and Hamilton had taken the first shot. But they were very angry. And it's been said in history, it's not so much what you do in history, but a lot of how you die is how you're remembered. Well, how more romantic can it be that you've been killed in a duel by the vice president of the United States on a foggy morning? Wow! It's the stuff stories are made out of. Well, Aaron Burr had to go into hiding, and Jefferson finally got it all straightened out, but he and Burr never did get along that well. And uh, he was kind of mad because he didn't, at the beginning, back in 1800, when there was a tie vote in the in the Congress, he was still mad at Burr because Burr didn't say, well, I don't want to be president, because Burr got to think, you know, I could be president. So, Mr. Burr is not asked to run again with the president, and his political fortunes are down the tubes. But when you go down the tubes, you have to leave New York. His popularity there is shot all to heck. He decides to go west. Now, you remember our first lesson when I told you what was the West? Kentucky is the West. So where did Aaron Burr come to after he left the office of vice presidency and having killed Alexander Hamilton? He came to Kentucky. And now it gets juicy. We have a Commonwealth attorney named Joseph Davis, who was a very strong advocate of Jeffersonianism, and he did not like Burr. So Burr comes and he visits the people around. He goes on down the Mississippi River, visits the people in Florida and New Orleans, and he visits people in Tennessee. He even goes to see Andrew Jackson. 
And while he's gone, Joseph Davis writes a letter to the president. And during this days, the president opened his own mail, didn't have secret service. He said he suspects, so he suspects that uh, perhaps Aaron Burr's out here to do no good. He thinks maybe he's going to try to get Kentucky to secede from the Union or some such nonsense. And the president wrote back, we'll find out more information. Well, while Burr is gone, Joseph Davis actually gets a court to issue a warrant for his arrest for treason. And when he gets back, Aaron Burr comes back and he turns himself in to the law because he's a very law-abiding man. He's a lawyer. He knows a bit. And he shows up, you know, he's dressed to the nines and he's very polite. And he has with him as a lawyer to defend him a man called Henry Clay of Kentucky. He's very well respected also. Well, Meanwhile, James Wilkinson, who had been involved in this conspiracy before, remember he had to leave town because they found that he wasn't paying his bills. <laughs> I get kind of amused when I think about it. Jefferson writes a letter to the president. I mean, Wilkinson writes a letter to President Jefferson stating that Burr is going to try to get Kentucky to secede from the Union. He's going to get up an army and he's going to form his own country and he's going to make himself king, if you would. Well, this, of course, upsets the president. So there's a trial. Now, there's three trials. There's a trial in Kentucky uh, led by Mr. Davis, and it was the verdict was no true bill. In other words, they, for treason, you've got to have two witnesses. There was no witnesses. There was no written trail. Uh, there were people saying, I heard, I think, maybe it's his personality. And in a court of law in, the, in this country, you've got to have evidence so that judge kicked it out. There's, you know, he's not guilty, he's not innocent. You just haven't got enough to go to trial. So he went again trial in New Orleans, arrested again for treason. Same thing, no true bill. Well, by now, everyone's thinking, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Maybe he was involved in treason. Maybe he was trying to get Kentucky to leave the Union. So the President Jefferson has him arrested on a federal warrant and tried in a, a federal court in Virginia. Same thing happened. No truth. There wasn't any evidence. It was all hearsay. But after three trials for treason, Aaron Burr's reputation is totally down the tubes. So he does the only thing he can do. He goes to Europe for the next 20 years. Meanwhile, the people in Kentucky are upset with Henry Clay, one of our favorite sons, for defending this accused person of treason. So Henry Clay says, I think he lied to me. He must have really been guilty. It's called PYOA, Protect Your Own Derriere. Okay, Burr's gone. Everything's cooled down a little bit. Now this area, this map, is called the Northwest Territory or the Midwest Region. And you can see it's seven states, but they're not states at this point in time. It's still called the Northwest Territory. And guess who's there? Indians. And we're going to have Indian problems again. Just when we get the problem with the Mississippi taken care of, it's the Indian problems again. Because a white man wants to move west. And Indians under the Shawnee Chief Tecumseh got together to try to resist. They, they just realized, you know, we've tried it before, but we've got to do it again. We've got to stop the white man. A man called General William Henry Harrison was put in command, and he was also told to, get this, persuade the Indians to give us land. Well, some of the Indians did give up some of their land, and Tecumseh told General Harrison that you may have the paperwork to it, but you're never going to occupy that land. And he leaves to go out to talk to some more of the Indian chiefs and other tribes. And General Harrison had told him he wouldn't do anything until he got back. Meanwhile, Harrison orders the military to surround something called Prophetstown, where the Indians were living, where uh, Tecumseh and his half-brother, the Prophet, lived. Well, now, what are you going to do? You're sitting fat, dumb, and happy at your teepee, and all of a sudden you see this military come up and surround you. And then they set up their campsite for the night. Now, what are you going to do? I mean, it's a foregone conclusion. You're not going to sit there and wait for them to come up and jump you in the morning. You're going to jump them. So sure enough, on the night of November the 6th, 1811, the Indians decided to attack the American military. There was heavy losses on both sides. 62 Americans were killed. And one of them was Major Joe Davis, uh, who was the Commonwealth Attorney. Remember him? He's the one who was causing all the problems for Aaron Burr. A man called Colonel Owens from the uh, Central Kentucky, and a lot of Kentucky instead. They were drinking their coffee when the Indians attacked. And it's Joe Davis, uh, who's going to be 
we're going to name Davis County, Kentucky after him, and it's because of a misspelling as D-A-V-I-E-S-S -S, instead of spelled the right way. Uh, Davis had been out here before. He had defended a man called Bill Smothers, who was given credit for settling the Owensboro. And Owensboro, of course, used to be called Yellow Banks, and Henderson was called Red Banks. But we're going to take them from Ohio County and some from Henderson County and create a new county called Davis County in memory of Mr. Davis. And Owens, of course, we changed the name of our little community called Yellow Banks to Owens Borough to honor the colonel who was killed there. A lot of Kentuckians were killed. And as a matter of fact, it's called the Battle of Tippecanoe, and it's right where the Tippecanoe Creek goes into the Wabash River. It's called the First Battle of the War of 1812. However, the War of 1812 hasn't started yet. But after the battle, the British found guns in the Indian dead hands that were, believe it or not, English made. And it was a foregone conclusion that it was, it was like adding two and two. You knew that the English were given the Indians' gun to go against the western states like Kentucky and kill and prevent us from moving any further farther west. That's one of the reasons we ended up going to war. Uh, Kentuckians, big time, because of the Ohio River and all that territory where there were the Indians, because we were always having Indian problems. Even though the Indian problems were supposed to be settled, there's always some Indians coming over and stealing horses and capturing and killing people. So Kentuckians and a lot of the other Americans began pushing for war. And like I said, England and France are at war again because even though they <laughs> captured Napoleon and put him on Elba, he escaped. So after about a few years of <laughs> peace between England and France, they're at it again. Napoleon's trying to retake France. And we're having trouble there stopping American merchant ships and impressing and visiting and searching. And when you see the little video, uh, the reason for the War of 1812, after you've listened to this, it goes into more detail and explains to you exactly. The impressment is basically involuntary drafting. Visiting and searching, they stopped the ships and searched for contraband. Of course, the leader of Kentuckians calling for war is a man by the name of our beloved Henry Clay. So let's spend a little bit of time on Clay. Now, he looks like He's been eating sour apples there, doesn't he? He was not born in Kentucky. He arrived in 1797, six feet tall, not good looking, but striking. Uh, very congenial and good conversations. Conversations. He loved to drink and he loved to gamble and endeared himself quite quickly to Kentuckians. He married a lady by the name of Lucretia in uh, Lexington. Uh, and I have searched and searched and searched and cannot find a picture of this woman anywhere, or even any kind of a portrait. Uh, all I can find is that she had a great personality, and she was wonderful in accounting. If it hadn't been for her, he wouldn't have been able to be away doing his congressional work. They had 11 children. All in all, he worked as a Kentucky representative. He was a United States senator. He was a United States representative. He was a speaker of the House of Representatives. Because he represented Aaron Burke during those trials in 1804. Uh, he was what they call a war hawk in 1811. He was leading the country trying to persuade the government to go to war. The War of 1812, and I've got a very brief summary here, uh, it began because of interference with trade and the English army and the Indians in the Northwest. No battles took place in Kentucky, but more than 9,000 Kentuckians did serve. But most of them didn't want to serve in were so far away from our state. I mean, they were fighting up in actually Canada. During this time, Shelby leaves retirement and is re-elected governor. So our beloved Isaac Shelby, our first governor, is now governor again of our state. There was even a time when we were getting a little bit overstretched because the England is still fighting with France. But once they capture Napoleon, England is now free to turn her entire attention on us. Oh, Katie barred the door. So, of course, one of the first things they were trying to do was to take our capital of Washington, D.C., and I'm sure you've heard the story about Dolly Madison saving the portrait of President Washington and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If you ever get a chance to read a biography of a First Lady, pick Dolly Madison. She was a trip. But something happened, and you're going to learn about Manifest Destiny in American history. It's where we believe we have the God-given right to move west. Now, it seems like the English are coming into Washington, D.C., and they're going to burn the Capitol down. They've set fires all over the place, and then something happened that had never happened before. 
a hurricane went up the Potomac River and rained down all the fires. And the winds were blowing so hard that the English military were having trouble standing up. They couldn't get their cannon to fire anything else. So we were convinced in our own mind that it was God's will. And God was on our side. The English weren't supposed to take it. But Dolly Madison is given credit with saving very important documents. So like it's a short war, like I said, but the Battle of Tippecanoe was called a prelude to the War of 1812 for their first battle. But the last battle of the war was called the Battle of New Orleans. And when we heard that they were going to be fighting in New Orleans, that's a lot closer to home than it is in Canada. So, of course, the Kentuckians rushed to enlist. They rushed so fast that they didn't wait to be equipped in Kentucky. They got to New Orleans and they had no weapons or no equipment. And Jackson said he'd never seen a Kentuckian without a deck of cards or a drink of whiskey. And, and these people were showing up without guns or shoes or anything. Well, New Orleans managed to furnish about 50% of them with equipment. And about four to 500 of the Kentuckians were put on the west bank of the Mississippi to help defend the city. And when the British finally arrived and attacked that area, the Kentuckians were fighting without weapons. There was hand-to-hand -hand combat. But it wound up being a huge loss for the English. And at first, General Jackson, who was leader of the American military at that time, he blamed the Kentuckians for almost losing New Orleans. He later found out and realized that these men that were doing the fighting had no weapons. They were fighting hand-to-hand, -hand and it stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British military and stopped them. So he started praising them. And, of course, the fighting reputation of the Kentuckian is now just almost beyond belief. Not only are we dead-eyed dicks with our Kentucky long rifles, and we're good at fight. We love to go to fights, but we can fight hand-to-hand. -hand. And of the 1,876 Americans killed in that war, more than 1,200 of them, 64% were Kentuckians. Just a little bit more about the American history. As I said, the Federalist Party, leader by Adams, has been badly weakened because of that Alien Sedition Act and everything else. But it's still got a strong following in the Northeast. But after the War of 1812, I mean, a feeling of pride and nationalism sweeps our country. And in American history, we call that the era of good feeling. We don't have any political problems. We, the president's running with unopposed. We're beginning to settle the boundary disputes between us and Canada and England. Uh, trade is increasing. Our industrialization is going gangbusters. It looks good. In 1819, the territory of Missouri has satisfied all the requirements of the federal government and requested admission into the Union as a state. Problem. At this point in time in history, in 1819, we have 22 states. We have 11 free states and 11 slave states. And Missouri wants to come into it as a slave state, which would give the South slave states the advantage in the Senate. Why? Because whereas the representatives are based on the population, senators every state, whether it be, you know, uh, Maryland or Delaware or Rhode Island, as small as they are, they get two senators as well as New York, as big as it is. So every state has two senators. And right now there is a good balance in the Senate between the South and the North. Well, the North objects. We don't want to have more slave states than free states. And the South screams loud and long, we're going to leave the Union if you don't let Missouri come in. So as I said, secession threats are heard, and not for the first time, because it, it, South Carolina has been threatening to lead secession since the Revolutionary War. So the solution, bring Missouri in as a slave state, bring in a free state, which is going to be Maine, to keep it in balance. So now we've got 24 states, we've got 12 and 12. Same balance, fine. But in this treaty, We've got no more slave states that are going to be admitted from the area called the Louisiana Territory, north of a certain line. So without even realizing it, the north is putting a fence around the slave states and trying to hem it in to prevent slavery from spreading north of the Ohio River, basically. But the south doesn't realize it at this time. Now this solution is going to be known as the Missouri Compromise, or Compromise of 1820. And Henry Clay gains a reputation as a great compromiser because he himself proposed it. So let's take a look at some of the cities. And of course, our two biggest ones, Louisville and Lexington. And I've got most of this information is in your text. In 1779, 
Lexington was established on the crossroads, not a river. She's one of the few major cities that's not on a major river. But center of that beautiful bluegrass area. And it didn't take long before she had manufacturing, she had private schools and academies and bookstores and printing houses and libraries and paved streets and two and three story buildings. She also has the home of the Transylvania University, which as we're going to learn in next lesson, uh, how important Transylvania University is going to become as a medical teaching school. It's also the place where Wilkerson, who left the state, established the first dry goods store. Like I say, in 1815, they had fire departments and police departments and three and four story buildings and a population of more than 9,000 people. It was a very sophisticated, it was kind of like the Athens. It was a beautiful little town full of really wealthy, educated people. And Louisville was established a year before that on the falls of the Ohio, but it was a little bit different. It, it grew differently. Uh, in 1807, more than 2,000 flatboats arrived. But in 1811, we got something called steamships. And that's how it begins. We have steamships going up and down the river, and they're, they're carrying flour and cotton and ropes and tobacco and bacon, lard, and, of course, Kentucky bourbon. But Louisville basically is going to be a city of two cities. One city is respectable, where they have businesses and homes and literary societies and libraries and dance and schools. But the other Louisville, uh, that's a respectable Louisville. The unrespectable Louisville is full of rivermen, uh, taverns and brothels and gambling dens and a lot of crime. And no matter how they try to clean it up, they just, the type of people working as stevedores on the docks, they just can't seem to get it done. A few state facts. By 1820, our population has grown to 564 plus thousand people. And we're now looking at about 34 years. I mean, we had 150 people in 1775, and now we've got over 500,000 in 1820. Now, black population is increasing more than the white population. But after 1820, the black population starts to decrease, primarily because the crops in Kentucky are not as labor intensive. We don't need labor as much as they do in the South. So you could say the population basically resembles North Carolina. We have uh, more whites than blacks, but it's still about 60-40. But a lot of our citizens are beginning to be concerned about importation of slaves. How are we going to handle this? So we start seeing a Kentucky image. And I always have trouble with these images because there is no such thing as a stereotype Kentuckian. But our image was of large, handsome men and good warriors. You bet your bippy. Anytime there was a fight, everybody won the Kentuckian. We were known for having the best bourbon around, the fastest horses, and the most beautiful women. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. Bourbon, horses, and beautiful women. We loved people. We loved to have them come into our homes and talk. Although we were anti-British, we would even welcome someone from England in if he would sit down and talk to us. So that was our image. But there was the unflattering image. There was the one that said we had no self-control and no group discipline. And we got offended way too easy and we were ready to fight at the drop of a hat. We also were addicted to gambling. And it's been said that a Kentuckian will sit around and whittle, and if he can't find anything to whittle, he'll cut the leg off a chair he's sitting on and whittle on that. Swearing? Oh, wait, we're good at that. And spitting? It's also been said that Kentuckians weren't nearly as good with hitting the spittoons as they were at shooting their long rifles. And many a traveler in the taverns got spackled, because if you don't know what a spittoon is, it's that kind of brass looks like a little child's potty that they would spit it.